accepted that Disneyland was the first true theme park making a distinction from amusement parks of the past, but it is not the first park to have been dreamt up by Walt Disney. The idea of building an amusement park style attraction where families could enjoy themselves together had been interesting Walt Disney for decades before Disneyland opened in 1955. And prior to making plans to build Disneyland, Walt had been looking very seriously at a smaller, more intimate park to be based at Disney's Burbank Animation Studios. And he was going to call it Mickey Mouse Park. Although it was ultimately never built, the extensive plans that were made and efforts of the studio were a huge influence on the ultimate design of Disneyland. Let's take a closer look at Mickey Mouse Park. Nineteen forty-six was a good year to be making movies. The Second World War had brought hardship and suffering to millions of people across the globe. Wanting to move on and enjoy some well-earned holidays, the distressed public on the home front escaped to the movie theaters in droves. In nineteen forty-six, nineteen pictures topped four million dollars at the U.S. box office. Prior to that, only twenty-five pictures had achieved that in the entire history of Hollywood. Unfortunately for Walt Disney, it looked like he might not have been invited to the party. The pre-war years had seen the studio soar to great heights with Walt at the helm as its father figure. The studio had produced the first animated short to boast synchronized sound, as well as the first feature to use the innovative Technicolor process. In 1937, Disney had released the first seriously considered animated feature, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. The film raked in a then huge $7.8 million during its initial theatrical run. The critics raved about it, the public loved it, and it seemed that Disney could do no wrong. Then came the war. The progressive and luxurious Disney Studio Complex was used by the United States military. And the animators, those who had not joined the military for active duty, were put to work on producing training and propaganda films for the war effort. The government did compensate the studio, but it barely covered expenses, and the work consumed the studio entirely. The war ended and the studio had changed. Disney's product seemed to have fallen out of favor with the American public, and MGM and Warner Brothers had successfully moved into the animation field, creating Disney's first serious competitors. By the end of 1946, the company was in debt and laid off almost half of its thousand employees. Later, Walt would recall, after the war was over, we were like a bear coming out of hibernation. We were skinny and gaunt, and we had no fat on our bones. Those were lost years for us. At the time, few could have predicted the path that Walt would take to revive both his company and his creative spirits. Looking back, it seems like the obvious choice for a person like Walt Disney. His movies had always been about fantasy, and they presented places far away from the world's current problems where your wishes came true. Why not make them real? While people may like to point to a single incident or location that led to Walt choosing to pursue building a theme park, there was no single thing. Instead, it appears the creation of the Mickey Mouse Park was the result of his interest in three separate but loosely related hobbies outside of his role as the head of an animation studio. Over a period of more than a decade, these gradually coalesced into one of the most ambitious, risky, and magical projects any entertainment business has ever undertaken. The first of these interests was a fascination with trains that was with Walt his whole life. As a child, his family lived on a farm in Marceline, Missouri, where the tracks of the Santa Fe Railroad ran nearby. Walt would put his ear to the rail to listen out for approaching trains, and sometimes the engineer on those trains would be his uncle, Mike Martin, who would bring a bag of hard stick candy with him. Struggling as farmers, the family moved to Kansas City in 1910. Walt's father, Elias, bought a newspaper distributorship with the money from selling the farm, and Walt was busy from then on as a delivery boy. His love of trains remained, and in 1917, his older brother Roy lent him the $15 bond needed to take a job as a news butcher for the Santa Fe Railroad. He ended up losing his brother's money, but he did enjoy traveling along the many rail lines to cities in half a dozen states. The pressures of running the studio caused Walt to collapse in what was diagnosed as a nervous breakdown in 1931. Doctors ordered him to take up a hobby and get some exercise, and he chose polo because of his love of horses, despite the objections of Lillian. But a serious back injury in 1938 forced him to consider other hobbies, and this is when trains became of great interest again. 
In 1945, Ward Kimball, one of Disney's best animators and sequence directors, invited his boss to a steam-in party at his house. To Walt's surprise, he found that Kimball had a narrow-gauge railway running through his backyard, which he had named the Grizzly Flats Railroad. It had a restored steam engine locomotive, the Emma Nevada, and Kimball persuaded Walt to take a turn at operating it. The experience made a huge impression on him. In 1948, it was suggested to Walt that he should take a vacation, and he chose the Chicago Railroad Fair. He brought his fellow steamer and animator from the studio, Ward Kimball, with him, and Walt attended the event with more than 100,000 other railway fanatics. The pair explored a series of themed villages, each representing a different tourist destination at the fair. They also visited the impressive Henry Ford Museum, which had a passenger train, carousel, and stern-wheeled paddle boat operating on the grounds for guest amusement. On his return home, Walt confessed to his wife Lillian, that was the most fun I ever had in my life. Walt was probably a bit jealous of his friend's backyard railroad and determined to build one of his own. Work soon began on the Carrollwood Pacific Railroad, which ran for a half mile around Walt's new Holmby Hills property. Walt named the engine the Lily Bell to help placate Lillian, who was less than enthusiastic about the project. Miniature trains were not the only small-scale replicas of real-world objects that captured Walt's imagination. At the same time, he was collecting new scenic elements for his epic miniature office railroad. He had the big idea of creating miniature scenes that could be displayed in large cases and toured all over the country. He even had a name for the tour, Disneylandia. Walt tasked layout artist Ken Anderson to draw 24 scenes of life in an old western town. Then he said, I'll carve the figures and make the scenes in miniature. Walt really put himself into the project, creating tiny chairs by bending wood in his family's pressure cooker. A narration was recorded and the project grew, but as it did, he realized that Anderson's scenes were too complex for him to produce on his own. He also felt something was missing. Movement. In 1949, Walt bought a mechanical caged bird during a visit to New Orleans. The bird would move its tail and beak and also tweeted out a song. Charmed and impressed, Walt had his engineers take it apart to find out how it worked. And after dismantling the bird, they found that its mechanisms consisted of clockworks and a double bellows. Coming back to his office miniatures, Walt wanted to create a scene of a frontier music hall complete with an entertainer performing a dance. He even hired actor Buddy Epson to dance on camera so his technical team could copy his movement in detail. Walt's team completed the project utilizing a series of cams and cables hidden by curtains. Once it became clear the Disneylandia project would not turn a significant profit as a touring display, Walt's interests began to turn elsewhere. Another huge influence on the creation of the Mickey Mouse Park was simply Walt's love of amusement parks. As a child growing up in Kansas City, Walt had frequently visited Electric Park, which was located just 15 blocks from the family home, so he was a park kid himself. As early as 1920, Walt is noted as saying, one of these days I'm going to build an amusement park, and it's going to be clean. After he became a father, Walt regularly took his daughters Diane and Sharon to Griffith Park in Los Angeles on Saturdays. In a 1963 interview seen in the Walt Disney Story, he recalled, I'd take them to the merry-go-round, sit on a bench, you know, eating peanuts. I felt there should be something built where the parents and the children could have fun together. When researching for Disneyland, he and his team visited dozens of amusement parks, including those in Coney Island in New York and Knott's Berry Farm in Buena Park, California. And he was known for grilling the operators, staff, and even visitors with questions. In the summer of 1951, Walt toured Europe with Lillian and visited the famous Tivoli Gardens in Copenhagen. The park dates back to the 19th century and even has an icy mountain-themed roller coaster. He was impressed by the cleanliness of the park, the beauty of the surroundings, the quality of the dining, and the professionalism and positive manner of the employees. It was a world away from what he had experienced at Coney Island. Now this is what an amusement place should be, Lillian. Upon his return, an excited Walt asked Harper Goff, an art director at the studio and future designer of the Jungle Cruise, to produce the preliminary sketches for a small theme park. These were expanded upon with drawings by architect John Cowles and animator Don DeGrotti to create a complete package for a park which Walt named the Mickey Mouse Park. It was to be located on the studio grounds. The park was designed to be small, family-friendly, and would intentionally differ from typical amusement parks of the era. Instead of concrete and high-throw roller coasters, it would offer grassy areas, picnic tables, water features, and mild rides that could be enjoyed by young and old guests together. 
The central area of the park was a village set at the turn of the century, which was clearly a precursor to Main Street USA at Disneyland. This village was built around a large green with a railroad station at one end and the town hall at the other. The village green would host benches, a bandstand, a drinking fountain, trees, and shrubs. Walt described it as a place for people to sit and rest. Mothers and grandmothers can watch over small children at play. It would be relaxing, cool, and inviting. The village had a fire station, a police station, and a selection of shops. All of these would be put to practical use rather than being simply for show. At the police station, guests could report lost articles and lost children. Walt even suggested that it could contain a small jail that guests could look into. The retail outlets would be representative of a typical American town in the early 20th century. The candy store would feature an attached factory where guests could watch old-fashioned sweet goods get produced. And Disney artists would be able to sell their works in the stores. An opera house was to host a large, well-appointed movie theater that could also be used for radio and television broadcasts. Food would be available at a colorful hot dog and ice cream stand and at a restaurant with private rooms for birthday parties. Statues of Disney characters would add to the ambiance throughout. A large section of the park would also be given over to a lake with an island in the middle circled by a stern-wheeled riverboat. A horse-drawn streetcar would carry guests to an Old West town. This would host a general store selling cowboy items, a pony ring, a stagecoach ride, a donkey pack train, and possibly a movie theater showing westerns. A frontier museum was also considered, as well as a small settlement of Native American teepees. From the western village, guests could board horse-drawn surreys. These could carry them through an old-fashioned farm to a carnival area. Perhaps surprisingly, given Walt's dislike for traditional amusement parks, this would be populated by roller coasters, merry-go-rounds, and typical midway stuff according to a memo he wrote. By the time Walt submitted his plans, the rides had become much more ambitious. They included a canal boat ride, a mock spaceship, and a submarine ride. The plans and sketches for Mickey Mouse Park were presented in March of 1952. The Parks and Recreation Board approved the plans, but the City Council subsequently rejected them, with one councilman proclaiming, We don't want the carny atmosphere in Burbank. We don't want people falling in the river or merry-go-round squawking all day long. Walt was dismayed, but by this stage, Burbank's rejection was more of a side note than a setback. Walt's ideas had outgrown the small site identified for Mickey Mouse Park. As early as four months prior to the council's decision, he had confided to an RKO official that he had been looking into the advisability of securing a plot of ground, something up to 200 acres for a larger project. Mickey Mouse Park never came to be. It had been conceived as a combination of elements from Knott's Berry Farm, heritage parks, and traditional carnivals. Disneyland was undoubtedly significantly more ambitious with its careful selection of multiple themed lands and coherent transitions between them. But the next time you visit a theme park, think about the influence that this ambitious little project has had on an industry that now entertains hundreds of millions of guests every year. Elements of Mickey Mouse Park live on in Disneyland, and we hope they live on forever. Thank you.